Today we're going to be talking about sleep, what happens in the brain when we sleep, how sleep occurs, and we're going to be talking about just brain rhythms in general. So about brain rhythms. Brain rhythms are, we can, brain rhythms obviously are um, repeating patterns of activity in neural circuits. Uh, there are plenty of examples of rhythmic activities that we see in the brain and in the nervous system. Sleeping and waking, as we will talk about, the, there's definitely rhythmic patterns that we observe there. Hibernation also sees changes in the brain. Breathing, walking, electrical rhythms of the cerebral cortex, those also include patterns as well. We talked a little bit about this when we discussed central pattern generators uh, in the course of like looking at the kind of rhythmic activity we see in the nervous system to regulate walking, say, in cats. The cerebral cortex has a, a number of important rhythms that are observed. We'll get into that a little bit. Um, and that there's a, a range of electrical rhythms that are correlated with very interesting behaviors. Then last, of course, we have circadian rhythms. This is where we can see changes in the physiological functions of our body according to a brain clock, which is more or less synchronized to 24 hours. And we're going to talk about that too. Before we get into overall brain rhythms within the cortex, I wanted to discuss a very important technique that is used for looking at brain activity in humans. This is called the electroencephalogram, EEG. This is used in clinical settings. It's also used in research settings. And in fact, um, one of the professors in the School of Neuroscience program, Sujith Bajan, he uses these in his patients, or subjects, I should say. The, um, so uh, this is how we measure generalized activity in the cerebral cortex. You have these leads that are placed across the, the, the scalp, um, on very specific places. So this is showing an, a diagram of what these specific places look like. The different letters refer to position of per particular cortical areas. So F is frontal, P is parietal, T is temporal, and then O is occipital. And so the recording from each pair of electrodes is somewhat different because the samples of activity of a population of neurons in a different brain region, right? You're not necessarily going to see exactly the same kind of activity in say the orbital cortex as you will in the frontal cortex, particularly if you're doing something like a visual stimulation, um, temporal or parietal, you might see differences related to auditory activity or if like they're looking at faces or something else, right? It's gonna, gonna be correlated somewhat with the activity of whatever the patient is doing or the subject, the research subject. And, um, uh, but you will see these overall rhythms as well, which is a very important feature of the brain. This technique can be and is widely used for diagnosing neurological conditions such as epilepsy and sleep disorders. And like I said, it's also used for research. So a little bit about how the electroencephalogram works. Um, the electrode is placed on the scalp and it measures the activity of a very large number of neurons in the underlying regions of the brain. Uh, each of these neurons, each individual neuron, is going to generate a very small electrical field that changes over time, change with how much activity is passing through those neurons. And so uh, from physics class, hopefully you know about the electric fields. You've learned, of course, that we have um, an electrical current that passes across the membranes of neurons and that there's a voltage associated with that as well. And whenever you have a current passing through neurons, that does create an electrical field. And the EEG electrode can detect that electrical field, especially when overall activity is synchronous. So the EEG measures synchronous signal from these, from not just, this is showing just a few, like 10 neurons. It actually is measuring the coordinated activity of thousands of, of neurons that are responding in a similar manner, more or less across the same time. And it can do this across the scalp. That's the amazing thing about it. All you need to do is just place it onto the scalp and you can detect brain activity as long as the activity is synchronous. So the uh, little bit about what the electroencephalogram looks like, the EEG, so that's the, the output of these data. 
and how this is collected, right? So we have, we're kind of showing the activity of six random neurons are sort of picked at random. And EEG is going to be the sum, summation of that activity. Uh, when neurons are firing irregularly, you're going to see their overall electric field that they generate being going up and down, um, going up and down, especially bit major deflections associated with action potentials, um, some minor deflections may be associated with changes in um, the uh, modulatory neuro neurotransmitters that come into the system. You know, there are lots of reasons why uh, the overall membrane potential may go up and down. Uh, but if the pattern of activity across neurons is irregular, all these small deflections, when you add them up across time, it just kind of looks like a, a squiggly line when you add it up. And um, yeah, so if the inputs are irregular or out of phase, their algebraic sum will have a small amplitude. And this is typically what we see in the waking state. So the uh, neurons across the brain are doing a lot of activity and are responding to stimuli and, and there's thinking going in, on and there's motor output. There's a lot going on when one is awake. And the overall pattern of activity that we see is relatively small amplitude and it tends to deflect up and down quite a bit. Uh, when neurons though, when they are ac activated in, a, um, in approximately the same time frame where they're working in a synchronized way, as you can see, now we're looking at neurons one through six, these random neurons here, and you can see that they're now firing at more or less the same pattern. When you add them up, these small deflections now add up to huge, big, big deflections. And then like the negative space leads to, to bigger decreases in overall EEG pattern. Uh, and this is, when we see this kind of synchronized activity, this is typically what we will see when uh, humans and animals are asleep. Uh, this is very similar to what we'll get into. They're called delta waves that characterize uh, stage four sleep. Um, we do see brain rhythm rhythms uh, when people are awake, as well as um, in particular when they're it's associated with certain states of behavior. Um, so, and the rhythms will change uh, depending upon what people are doing. Um, so here's here's some of the major rhythms that are are uh, where we can categorize things, and it's really determined by the frequency of the rhythms, like how quickly up and down these deflections are occurring. And so beta rhythm is the fastest frequency. Um, we see that when one when the cortex is activated, or if someone's paying attention or doing something in particular, uh, we see what's called beta rhythm. And so we will see these deflections up and down of around 15 to 30 hertz. So relatively fast. And here's an example of what beta rhythms look like. And then we have alpha rhythms. This is during the quiet waking state. So if you're just sitting there, the, the, um, the coordinated activity that we can observe in an EEG is then on the order of around 8 to 13 hertz. So, you know, it can be as little as half of the attentive cortex. So in any given EEG, um, so just focusing on these first two patterns, um, for a research subject that's doing some sort of task, we will see uh, when the, like say right before a subject is doing a task, you're gonna see relatively large deflections. It will be different across the different electrodes. It won't necessarily be fully synchronized in, when an individual is awake. And, but in general, what you will see if someone is just sort of sitting there relatively quiet, but they are awake, you're going to see these alpha rhythms. And depending upon the electrode that you're looking at, you could see certain things like blinking artifacts. So this is activity associated with when the individual is blinking because it's really right close here to the, to the eye and um, it's detecting some of the activity coming from the neurons that regulate blinking. Um, uh, so some of the... Uh, the, uh, the, the facial nerves associated with that. Um, but then when someone is doing a task, you can see the activity here is smaller in amplitude, right? So amplitude is in this direction, and that the activity is going up and down faster. So this would be beta rhythm. So this would be like someone transitioning from a quiet state to doing something more attentive 
Then there are theta rhythms. So this is even slower. Certain wake states can have this, but some sleep states also sleep states also have theta rhythms. Um, and then we can also observe theta rhythms as being part of uh, um, specific parts of the brain in particular. Then there is delta rhythms, and that's what I referred to in the previous slide when you see these very large, deep uh, uh, deflections that are relatively slow, only four hertz. So going up and down only four times per second versus 30 times per second. This is what we see during deep sleep. Then there are other important rhythms such as spindles and ripples. We have talked about spindles and ripples a little bit in the hippocampus, and we're going to talk about them again. So deep sleep is really characterized as having very high synchrony where, you know, you can see here the different electrodes aren't terribly synchronous. There's some synchrony uh, with nearby electrodes, but uh, they're not very synchronous, but uh, in deep sleep, you're going to see much higher synchrony across all electrodes, and you're going to have a very high EEG amplitude, so it'll be much higher than this. So the, the deflections of the trace are going to go up and down much bigger than this. Seizures is another form of rhythmic activity that can be detected with an EEG, uh, but this is dysregulated activity that happens across the brain. And you'll see these huge deflections with a relatively high rate. Around 1.2% of Americans suffer from epilepsy. This is around 3.4 million people. And there's more than 65 million people globally who suffer from epilepsy. Additionally, around 1 in 26 people will develop epilepsy at some point during their lifetime. So as people get older, you do run the risk of increasing your chances of getting epilepsy. So epilepsy causes repeated seizures. That's the definition of epilepsy. And there can be many causes to it. Um, uh, the, you can get epilepsy from uh, tumors. It can be a sign of having a glioma, for instance. Um, brain trauma, an accident, can lead to lifelong epilepsy. We know that there's underlying genetics which can cause epilepsy. Uh, infections such as uh, meningitis can cause epilepsy and damage the brain where then you would have permanent epilepsy. Certain vascular diseases, um, and then there are many cases where it's just unknown. Um, there are two kind of ca categories of epilepsy. I mean, and there's more su subtle categories below that. There's generalized seizure, which includes the entire cerebral cortex, um, this was characterized as having complete behavior disruption and consciousness loss. So in the entire cerebral, if you're looking at an EEG, so this would be probably an example of someone undergoing generalized seizure, you can see overall activity is huge across all of these electrodes. Um, and likely this would lead to the person suffering from behavior disruption and they would probably lose consciousness after this. Uh, a partial seizure, is a circumscribed cortical area. So you will see so certain effects happening within a, a person. You may get some sort of abnormal sensation, for instance, or you might like, for instance, see an aura, which is sort of a, a glowy sort of light feature that might appear within your vision. That can be a sign of a partial seizure. And you can have both of these things happening. And we also talked about some of the treatment for seizure already when we talked about split brain patients, one way for patients who suffer from frequent generalized seizures to alleviate some of their symptoms is to slice the corpus callosum so that you are disconnecting the two hemispheres of the brain. And um, it has certain effects as we learned about with language, but mostly these patients are more or less fine. And for man many of them, it relieves the problem of having generalized seizure where they do lose consciousness on a regular basis because the source of the seizure might be specific to one particular part of the brain and it won't be spreading to the other hemisphere. So it usually is very beneficial for these patients to get that done. So let's talk a little bit about sleep. Um, so that's what we're going to talk about for the rest of today's presentation. In adults, duration of sleep each night. So this is something, you know, it's an important thing. Uh, we don't focus on it nearly enough. Um, just in general, many of us suffer from having poor sleep conditions um, and poor sleep habits. The, and it has a huge effect on overall quality of life. And it's, this is important because um, sleep really does take up around one third of our entire life.
So about one third of what we're doing for the not, the entire time that we are alive is sleeping. So sleep, uh, the duration of sleep in adults is is normally distributed around 7.5 hours of sleep. Um, uh, but there's a range, right? So just like anything, there's going to be a range of what is typical. There are some people who need a little bit more sleep. Um, but if you just look at the overall range of this distribution, this suggests that around two thirds of the population sleeps somewhere between 6.25 and 8.75 hours. So here to here, that's two thirds of the population. There are some people who need very little sleep or are only getting a little sleep. And there are some people who tend to sleep an awful lot. The duration of sleep, it changes as people age. So um, the, uh, uh, this is hours of day here. Um, and here in blue is the time spent asleep and the time spent awake. And then this is age. So I guess we have some data showing that the fetus is asleep. Apparently prior to the onset of birth, they're asleep basically 24 hours a day. But then all of a sudden they are, they do have some waking time. And this is, this would be when the baby is kicking. Um, and, and that tends to happen in the last trimester. Um, but then at birth, uh, a typical infant will sleep about 16 hours a day. Um, that's twice as much as a typical adult, which is around eight hours. And you can see at one year of age, it's now around, hmm, what is that? 14 hours or so. And then by 10, it's now down to about 10 hours. Um, by age 20, now you're an adult and it's now you're within this range where it's about eight, but it continues to decline all the way up until death. So older people generally just need less sleep and tend to sleep less. We see different patterns of activity in the brain through different phases of sleep. So um, this is, we've talked a little bit already about the awaking state. Um, and the kind of activity that we see here where the frequency of the activity, the up and down deflections per second is going to be relatively high, especially if one is paying attention to doing something it can get up to as much as 60 Hertz, but it's typically between 15 and 30 Hertz and it's going to be low amplitude. So it's going up and down very quickly, but it's not, we're not seeing huge deflections and that's not because neurons aren't firing. In fact, they're firing a lot. They're just doing it asynchronously. And because an EEG electrode sums, it adds up all the activity of the neurons that it's seeing, some are going up and down at different times. And so it adds up to, to being a relatively small deflection because they're not synchronous. Okay, so that's, this is called um, either alpha or beta activity. So the beta activity is gonna be, um, uh, that's gonna be typical of someone doing more focused type activity. Um, then, as an individual is going into sleep, so this this is over the first like hour that we see. This will be typical of what we see is someone is falling asleep. So it takes this person's falling asleep after about 10 minutes. And then they're in stage one. And if we're just continuing to record as they're falling asleep, this is now an, a non-REM sleep. REM being rapid eye movement when the eyes are flitting around. We'll talk about that a little bit. In the first phase, we don't see that for the first hour or so. Um, and this is characterized by having decreased EEG frequency. So now we're down to about four to eight Hertz and increasing amplitude. So the amplitude you can see is bigger. These are called theta waves, as we talked about before. Then in stage two, we're, um, it's characterized as having around 10 to 12 Hertz oscillations. Um, and these, these, uh, so it's a little bit faster than stage one. But what's going on here is what, what are called sleep spindles. So this is gonna be very typical of stage two. We're gonna see these relatively short bursts of rapid activity that are gonna be synchronized where you see large deflections. So the amplitude is very big. This is called a sleep spindle. And this is typically what we see during stage two. During stage three and four, generally these kind of are lumped together. In fact, um, According to Dr. Vijayan, um, I believe he says that stage three and four is essentially the same thing now. Uh, but for purposes of this, what we're learning here is uh, slightly different, that there's still two different categories. This is still non-REM sleep. And this is where you're going to have very large amplitude waves that are very 
slow in their frequency um, and around uh, 0.5 to 4 hertz. And it's thought that these slow wave uh, oscillations help with memory consolidation, as we will talk about across a bunch of different slides. Then after deep sleep, the sequence changes and a period of rapid eye movement or REM uh, sleep uh, begins. This is characterized by having low voltage, high frequency activity to um, uh, within the EEG of individuals who are awake. So even though they are asleep, their eyes are moving around almost like people are looking at something. And um, the uh, and then the activity here um, tends to look pretty similar to what we see to when people are awake, even though they are asleep during REM sleep. And something to emphasize here is that even though this diagram makes it look like each stage of sleep is approximately the same, um, they are not exactly the same, uh, as we'll see. There are physiological changes that occur as one passes through the various stages of sleep. So we're gonna look at data taken from one patient, looking at various changes in their overall uh, physiological status of various things. So um, the first thing is, is just looking at the EEG, right? So that'd be the first thing that we would look at. And so we're monitoring brain activity and you can see as one falls asleep, they quickly go into deep sleep. And then they come back up and they have a very short, brief, maybe 10 minutes of REM sleep. They will cycle back down into deep sleep and then back up and they'll have more REM sleep and then go back down, maybe not as deep as before um, during the first two phases. Uh, generally after about four hours, you don't really achieve the deep sleep state as observed in the first couple of cycles of sleep. And REM sleep tends to get longer and longer as one stays asleep until you eventually wake up. This kind of figure is called a hypnogram, which I think is a great name, hypnogram. There are other things you can measure, other measures of physio physiology. So in B here, what we're looking at is two different measurements. We're looking at EOG, which is the electrooculogram, measuring eye movement. And you can see that the eyes are moving an awful lot during REM sleep. This is one way of quantifying that. And so you can measure these things. The other thing that we can look at is neck muscles. So using an electromyogram or an EMG, we can monitor those things. And uh, you can see that the uh, there's there tends to be greater movement occurring, at least you know, as far as the neck is concerned, around REM activity. So the, this these REM phases really do seem to be sort of like just below waking state. And there's some activity happening here that it really isn't super different, at least superficially from the awake state, including eye movement and even neck muscle movement. And then during the deeper phases, we don't see eye movement and we don't see movement of um, muscles. Then in C, we can look at other things that are changing too. Heart rate, respiration, both of these go down during deep sleep and they tend to come back up during REM sleep. So you can see that these things are cycling as well in a rhythmic pattern and that they correlate with the REM sleep, that the increased respiration and increased heart rate lasts longer during these later phases because that's during the phase of REM sleep. And then last, what we have on here, um, so obviously we're looking at a male's data here, penile erection. So you can measure the, uh, uh, I guess strain gauge unit. Um, um, you can see this goes up to 30. I, I, I can tell you that's not inches. Um, I'm not entirely sure what strange gauge unit means. 30 of something. <laughs> um, it's the first phase, you don't get up quite that high, but eventually you do. But you can see that this is also correlated with REM sleep. So I suppose this person's dreaming something in particular. All right. So anyway, moving on. Um, so that, yeah, so those are various rhythms that we're going to see with associated with sleep. There are circadian rhythms too. Sleep is part of that, of course. Um, what circadian means, it means across the day, circa being circle and dia being day. And so we're going to have day, things that dictate their circadian rhythms is mostly going to be light. So we have daily cycles of light and dark. In particular, animals, they live out you know, where the only light that they really see is the sun, 
And then when it gets dark, it's dark. And it's more or less uniform for animals um, that live out in the wild. Uh, humans, we have messed up our exposure to daily cycles uh, because we have lights. And that has actually really messed up probably uh, all kinds of things for people leading to seasonal affective disorder um, and other problems. And so, yeah, uh, we spend a lot of our days inside and then, but we keep the light on even through the night and, and looking at Netflix and looking at our phones. Not good, um, as we'll talk about here in just a bit. So uh, we can measure these various things and seeing what changes from day to day. You're gonna see that um, during the awake phase, you're gonna have, if you're measuring alertness, it's gonna be relatively high. Body temperature is something that increases. Uh, it actually changes depending upon which phase of the day we're talking about. So there's a daily pattern of body temperature that occurs and it's higher during awake phase and during sleep phase, our body temperature actually goes down. Um, we see pulsa pulsatile changes in overall levels of hormones too. So um, growth hormone is something that generally will only be released during the early phase at night and is generally low during the day. So that whole thing about, yeah, you grow at night, maybe there's something to that because it's growth hormone during that phase. Cortisol is something that we know is associated with stress, but really cortisol is also regulating our overall um, body alertness. And one thing that happens is that our levels of cortisol actually decrease during the day, especially if we're not under chronic stress. And then at night, just at the onset of sleep, that's when it's lowest. But over the course of our sleep cycle, near the end of sleep, cortisol levels shoot up. And you would think, oh, is that a stress response? No, not necessarily. What's happening here is the cortisol is just being released and it's preparing our body to increase our overall metabolism, getting our body temperature up, releasing glucose so that we can get up and do stuff. And so cortisol, this is another important function of cortisol. And then even there are circadian changes in overall um, access to certain nutrients like potassium. Uh, the daily rhythm and darkness cycles, if they're removed, the circadian rhythms continue. So if you take, if you put an animal in an all light phase, you will still see these circadian patterns, despite the fact that the night, the night phase is missing. Or if you put them in a dark, you'll see the same thing. Um, but the brain clocks, they require occasional resetting. So we have a brain clock that sort of sets this in motion. So this is going way, way back to the very first lecture. This is actually a slide that we've already seen um, talking about an, another type of retinal ganglion cell, cell called the intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cell. So we talked about uh, in great detail the, radi um, the retinal ganglion cells that receive the input from cones and rods and through the bipolar cells, remember all this stuff. Um, and then transfer that information to eventually to like the visual cortex where we can then create visual images. Well, we have these other kinds of cells called intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells that um, do not receive input from rods and cones. They have these very large dendrites, very, very large processes that go with them along the surface, along with the other retinal ganglion cells. And instead of getting input from cones and rods, they are sensitive to light, and it's because they have their own photopigment called melanopsin, which is sensitive to blue light. Um, 476 nanometers, I think, is its peak sensitivity. So these intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells, they are depolarized by light, which is the opposite of what happens in rods and cones. So when you shine light on these, instead of what happens in rods and cones, which is they become hyperpolarized, these guys become depolarized and it takes a long time. So you can see uh, showing shining light. So we're shining light on here and we're looking at the activity of an intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cell or a cone. And so the cone responds super quickly within milliseconds and it maintains hyperpolarization when you shine on the light. A, um, these intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells, however, after about a couple of minutes of stimulation, the membrane potential gets high enough where it starts to fire. And now it, start, now it starts firing a whole bunch. And after the light turns off, it continues to fire for another couple of minutes. So it has a very long action in which it occurs. It takes a little long, a long time for it to get started, but it'll eventually start firing and firing a ton. 
and then eventually it takes a long time for it to, to ramp off. Seems like a perfect kind of measurement for slow, steady changes in light, say like when the sun rises in the morning or when the sun sets at night, right? They seem like almost perfectly attuned to that. These neurons are connected to a part of the brain called the suprachiasmatic nucleus. So the suprachiasmatic nucleus lives right here. It's right above the chiasm. Supra means above, chiasmatic, chiasm. So it's, it's a little tiny brain area. We have two of them on either side of the brain, located right here, right above the optic chiasm, deep in the hypothalamus. Um, so an intact suprachiasmatic nucleus produces a rhythmic message. The, SS, the SCN firing cells, they, they fire um, in, in, a, uh, in a way that correlates with a, an overall circadian rhythm. So they have a 24 hour sort of cycling that they do with changes in activity. They're receiving input from these intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells. So this is the retinal input here. That's these intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells synapsing onto the neurons within the SCN. So you have to have retinal input um, in order to entrain the sleep cycle. So the 24-hour cycle is maintained by this input from the retina. Um, the SCN outputs has axons that go to parts of the hypothalamus. It, it connects to the midbrain, uh, the diencephalon, and it uses GABA as its primary neurotransmitter. So its overall activity is going to be one that relatively shuts things down. So that's just its overall psych cycle. Um, each uh, these neurons will have a molecular mechanism that occurs in here uh, that inv involves. This is a very simple description of a, of this molecular mechanism, and it, it kind of has a, a a neat way in which it works. So um, it, this operates as a molecular clock, which is going to be pretty close to twenty four hours. We find similar molecular clocks, in, um, obviously in humans and mice, um, all vertebrates, in, in, and even fruit flies, and even non-animals like mold have molecular clocks built into them. So the, the clock genes that are most well characterized is the period gene, or, or PER, cytochrome, or CRY. Um, there's a gene called clock, and then BMOL, and they reciprocally inhibit each other. So we can kind of walk through what happens here is that you have, um, let's see. So we've got uh, BMOL and clock. So let's say that we have BMOL and clock. It's relatively high. Um, and so at, as its expression increases, uh, these act as transcription factors. So they bind up next to each other. They create a heterodimer and they bind to the promoter of other clock genes called period and cry. So these guys are going to induce the expression of period and cry. So these guys start to increase the amount of protein that's being made, and it takes some hours for that to happen. And then they work to, to decrease the expression of BMOL and clock. So if these guys are increasing, now these are decreasing. So now there's less of this, and there's less of this to, to drive the promoter. And so then period and cry starts to decrease because they slowly degrade. And this whole thing of like reciprocal negative inhibition where these guys cause these to increase, but then these guys cause these to decrease. You got a negative feedback loop here working. It takes around one day, uh, approximately 24 hours for this to work. And the light that comes in from the retina helps make sure that this is set to a precise 24 hours. Um, they are entrained by light, right? So, um, and this serves as what's called, uh, in neuroscience, we refer to it as the Zeitgeber, which is German for time giver, because um, uh, this was first characterized and discussed uh, by a German scientist. Called it the Zeitgeber. And it's a cool name, so we kept it. I want to keep the name. Other parts of the brain that contribute to control of sleep um, is the pineal gland. So this is another gland that sits within the brain. This is different than the pituitary gland. So that's over here. The pineal gland is way back here, um, you know, sort of back towards the where the cerebellum is. Um, sort of, it's pretty close to this um, to the uh, superior colliculus. Uh, so the pineal gland is here, but it's way deep in the brain. And this is this is the gland that releases melatonin. 
So melatonin is made in this gland and um, it has a circadian pattern as well. It starts to secrete at the onset of night. So as darkness uh, comes on, uh, my, uh, melatonin starts to increase. And melatonin peaks in the middle of night and then it decreases and falls to normal um, levels by early morning. So um, when, when someone is jet lagged, they can take melatonin right before going to bed to help reset their overall internal clock because melatonin is one part of that. Melatonin also has, there's receptors all across the body and including many parts of the brain uh, that have melatonin and melatonin receptors. So melatonin will act on the brain to sort of reset and induce, uh, prepare the brain for getting into these phases of, of going into deeper sleep, deeper and deeper sleep. So this is one way in which the brain uh, can, can prepare the brain but also across the whole body and getting it into changing its overall physiology, melatonin is one of the keys for that. When we are looking at overall circadian activity, um, one way that we can do this is, is use what's called an ethogram. So ethogram, gram again, means like drawing or, you know, like, um, like uh, an encephalogram, right? Electroencephalogram measures it's a drawing of the electrical activity in the brain. An ethogram is a drawing uh, or measuring of activity of behavior. Etho means um, behavior. Ethics is the study of, of like good behavior, right? So ethogram is studying behavior. Uh, so tracking behavior over time uh, is done. This is one way that we can look at ethograms um, and it can be represented in graphical form. And this can be used to see a circadian rhythm. So under natural situations, when an animal is um, given an, a normal light dart cycle, so, you know, like um, going from morning to midnight and then to noon and midnight, typically in an ethogram like this, you're going to have two days represented on each line, uh, which is one way of, of just seeing behavior. Um, and uh, to, to look at the overall change of behavior uh, pattern. So, so the, basically the way this works in an ethogram is that you're going to have certain behaviors that'll happen on the first day, and then you'll have um, behaviors following on the second day. And, uh, and then you can, and then the next day will be the, will be day two up here. So then this will be day two and then day three, and then you have day three and day four. I know it sounds a little weird, but essentially that's, that's how this is done. You're tracking more or less 48 hours of, of activity. So under a natural situation, where you have normal light conditions, you're gonna see a circadian rhythm that is maintained from day to day. So 10 days of behavior and, the, and whatever behavior that we're seeing here that would occur on a given day is essentially occurring um, on that day uh, at the, approximately the same time every single day. But then as soon as you get into a free running situation, and this is when they are deprived of their zeitgebers. So no on and off of light is typically how that works. So they're either in complete darkness or complete lightness. Uh, they settle into a rhythm activity um, where, they, where they are maintaining some sort of schedule, but it tends to drift out of phase and tends to fall along um, either going long or short, depending upon the nature of the animal of like what's happening within that animal's brain. Some animals actually tend to run where the, where the behavior starts to emerge earlier and earlier each and each day. This behavior seems to be showing up later and later, which indicates that its natural clock is actually a little bit longer than 24 hours. So if it gets later and later each and every day to the point where like about three weeks later, all of a sudden we're, we've, we've passed a, over a single day, this is an indication that this animal's clocks is, is probably around like 25 hours instead of 24 hours. The natural clock without a zeit giver. Um, and then you can return and then train back to getting um, the zeitgeber, and then all of a sudden activity synchronizes again. So um, the components of a biological clock is that you have to have some sort of light sensor. That would be the intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells. It will act on a clock, something, some way for the brain to, to, to keep track of time, and that's the suprachiasmatic nucleus. And then there's going to be an output in which it'll have input uh, affecting other areas of the brain, such as the pineal gland, um, regulating cortisol levels, um, regulating uh, the, the 
brain waves that occur within the brain, those kinds of things. So there's going to be all kinds of outputs from, from that. Okay, so that's talking about the mechanisms of sleep, how we go about sleeping. Now we're going to talk about what the point of sleep is. Like, why do we even do it, right? Like, this is a third of our life, and we're basically laying in bed for that third. Not to say that, like, there's something wrong with laying in bed. I mean, I like it too, but we, um, you know, got to get up and do stuff. And for some of the busy bodies, they'd be like, you know, if I could just have those eight hours, I, I could do all kinds of stuff, right? So um, sleep allows for repair and restoration of our organ systems. And this includes our muscles, our immune systems, and various hormones. So it really is necessary for this to occur. So people who don't get any sleep at all, they will start to see degradation of their overall body, including the brain. And, and you can actually die from lack of sleep. You can go, if you go more than 10 to 14 days of sleep, you will either go into deep psychosis or you will die. So it really does need to happen. It's absolutely necessary. But sleep also plays a crucial role for uh, consolidating memories and allowing for the retention of experiences during the day for later use. And so this is what we're going to talk about um, uh, for the next several slides here. So we already talked about this, um, about hippocampal place cells, that there are these neurons in the hippocampus that seem to fire at a particular place along a track when a mouse is going along the track. One of the very cool, neat things that we've learned about how the brain works over the last 20 years. Um, and so each of these colors represents an individual neuron in the brain of this mouse that's on this track. Here he is at the end of the track. And so like this yellow neuron here, it was really only firing when the mouse was at this part of the track. And here's a neuron that fired at the red part, but it also fired a little bit over here. Here's one that's just orange. Particular places where they like to fire. And so the idea with this is that the hippocampus is um, arranged uh, in an order, they can be arranged in an order of location as they travel through the maze, and that they're going to be particular places along the track where individual neurons will fire, or groups of neurons will fire, right? And it's going to represent to the mouse where they are along the track, because they have memorized the track. We also learned that there are these sharp wave ripples. Again, this is, so these are sort of like the, the sleep spindles, but these are ripples that occur that we can see within the hippocampus. Um, and when we look at the activity of these neurons, that they correlate with the overall pattern of that they fire as they go along the track. So this will happen right before the animal goes on the track. It'll go in the direction that the animal is going to be going along the track. So like the beginning of here and the end here. And then when they finish the track, it goes in reverse order. And this is all very short. This is all like 50 milliseconds, right? So then the neurons that would fire near the end of the track, they, they fire near the beginning, and then the neurons at the beginning fire at the end. So it's almost like the, the mouse is doing a quick sort of rememorization of the, of the track um, button backwards pattern. Like, hey, I found the cheese at the end. Now I'm going to remember that. It reinforces the memory. And the ripples are critical for... Uh, in order for mice to, to learn these, these tasks. And this is what it looks like. So i um, got a mouse on a track. Um, there's going to be a sharp wave ripple as soon as this mouse gets near the end. So we're looking at the play cells here. And when he gets near the end, he's got his cheese. And then we're going to watch a sharp wave ripple. There's going to be two of them. see how it's kind of in reverse order there very sharp very quick that's a sharp wave ripple okay and it's an important wave and in, and and they have to have this happen in order for them to memorize it one thing that we see is that in the brains of mice and rats when they are asleep they will also show these sharp wave ripples which is really pretty crazy so they will replay these sharp wave ripples so this is this is the sharp wave ripple that we can see in a mouse um, when it's doing a, a, a doing going through the running phase. Um, oh, no, I'm sorry, this isn't a sharp wave ripple. This is just the play cells, right? So this is as they're going through, and this is the activity that we see of the play cells as they're going through the track. So this is the running phase. Then you let them fall asleep, and now we're seeing sharp wave ripples. So the, the difference here is the, the time scale, right? So this is across one second. That's So this would be about five seconds of, of activity. 
much too long for a sharp wave ripple. This is just play cells. And now we're only talking about 200 milliseconds here. And here we have uh, a, a sharp wave ripple occurring over just a, f a couple of hundred milliseconds and really most of it over about 50 milliseconds um, that occurs during sleep in the same order as they ran. So they're doing these sharp wave ripples when they're asleep. So it's almost like the rodents are dreaming about doing the track, but this activity is helping to reinforce memory. And if you mess with this, even during sleep, you can mess up with how well the mouse will do on the track the next day. We, one thing I didn't talk about during the class um, is that if you look in the visual cortex, you will see a somewhat similar pattern, not nearly as nice and precise as hippocampal place cells, but you can find neurons that will respond to the visual input um, within the visual cortex. And it's this is because the hippocampus is taking in sensory information and there's gonna be certain things that will elicit activity within the hippocampus. Part of what they're memorizing is what things look like. And so we will see patterns of activity that can occur in the hip and in the visual cortex as well. Different neurons firing at different places because they're looking at different things, right? Because of the, the places look different. We can see similar activity, again, sort of sped up, but similar activity happening even in the visual cortex when animals are asleep. So it's almost, again, like they're, they're dreaming, um, but it's, it's a bit sped up. We talked about the song control system. Here, uh, we talked about it quite a bit. We remember the song control system. We have HVC and RA, that these are important brain areas um, for the production of song. Um, so I just want to talk about what we know a little bit about this with the song control system in sleep. Um, so when you place electrodes into the brains of birds into HVC, and we learned that there will be very specific firing of HVC neurons at particular places um, when they are firing. Um, this is true for, you know, so that we're just looking at two examples here. So this is one bird song. Uh, a zebra finch, and it has particular firing that occurs basically every time. When the bird is asleep, we can see spontaneous firing, like we're just monitoring activity, we're not doing anything, they're asleep. You can see spontaneous firing that occurs um, that matches exact, almost exactly the kind of activity that we see when the bird is actually singing. So it's almost like the birds are, are replaying their songs as well. And that they're just just like the the mice and rats going through the the maze. It's almost like these birds are dreaming about singing. And this is just a different example for a different bird showing exactly the same thing. And it's not perfect, right? Like normally you would um, for these neurons, you would see very specific activity occurring, um, but uh, the spontaneous activity can be very very similar. So. These all, all these experiments suggest that sleep helps to reinforce memories by replaying the circuits while asleep. So we, we specifically know this in rodents, and I believe that there's data with uh, songbirds as well, that when you interfere with this process, uh, even in birds, that they, they don't learn the song as well when you are interfering with, with just when they are singing. There's a bunch of data showing the relationship of the importance of sleep and memory reinforcement in humans. So I'm gonna walk through a little bit of, of this as well. Um, uh, in in a, two experiments in humans that we've done. So um, in this experiment, we have uh, a, seri a series of tasks that a, a human is supposed to do. Okay, so they come into the lab, they do a, a learning sort of like um, um, a card matching experiment. So they've got, what is this, uh, six by five, so 30 cards, and they've got to memorize like where the different pictures are. That's essentially what the task is. And they're given an odor when they are learning this. And then they fall asleep in the lab, and then they will be presented with an odor or not at the very, you know, sometime in relationship to sleep. In this particular example, what they're showing is that they're providing the odor when this person is in deep sleep. But we can also provide the odor when the person is, say, in REM sleep, or we can do it before they fall asleep and then let them sleep, right? So they get essentially the same thing. Then when they wake up, they take the task again, and then we're going to ask them, hey, 
how well did you learn the task? And and the older part here is just to to kind of because there's there's going to be some sort of experiential correlation to having this unique odor while you're doing the learning. It might be that this is going to be eliciting activity in the brain that will replay some of what happened before. And but having the actual odor present might replay it a little bit better. Who knows? That's the hypothesis here. So let's take a look at what the data shows. In this experiment, they had four groups. Um, so you have to have all kinds of different controls when you're doing this because you have a whole bunch of different things going on. So in the first experiment, um, you have the odor during the learning phase, and then you have the odor during the, the um, uh, deep sleep phase, and uh, but no other time. In experiment two, no odor during the learning phase, but the odor is presented during the deep sleep, sleep phase. This is to, to, in, to test, to make sure, okay, well, maybe it's just giving the odor during the deep sleep phase that's important, right? Like, and But it doesn't matter if they had the odor during the learning phase. In experiment three, they present the odor during the learning phase, but now we're presenting the odor during the REM phase later on during sleep. And this is testing to see, is the phase of sleep important? And then in experiment four, we're doing the odor, uh, but then we're doing the, um, during the learning phase. And then we present the odor during waking, but at approximately the same time when it would occur, uh, when the individual when the other group would have fallen asleep. So it's, a, so it's the same amount of time between odor during learning to when the second odor was presented, but no learning going on there. And then they have a normal sleep phase and then there's no odor at the end. So those are the four groups. Try to keep that in mind as we look at the data on the next slide. What we can see is that for those individuals who had odor during the deep, uh, deep wave sleep, slow wave sleep, SWS is what they're showing here, but deep, deep sleep. Um, those individuals who had the odor during the learning phase and slow wave sleep recalled the locations of the task better than a, a, a control where they didn't really get an odor. And then the other experimental groups, they showed no difference. So when they got the odor just during slow wave sleep, it didn't make a difference. When they got the odor during learning and REM sleep, it didn't make a difference. And when they got the odor during learning and then waking, and then they fell asleep, that also made no difference. So the idea here is that by, by presenting the odor during these important slow wave sleep, sleep phases, it's probably eliciting activity in the brain. Your sensory information is still working and that it's going to replay that information. So the, clearly in humans, there's something important about the slow wave sleep phase, the deep sleep phase. Something is going on that allows for consolidation of memories. And uh, so in a different experiment, they did a learning test uh, before they fell asleep. And then they just did some, some uh, um, they, they stimulated the brain in order to boost the slow wave oscillation. So they're getting more and deeper slow wave sleep oscillations during sleep. And then, and that's it. So either during the, that first phase or not. And then they do the test at the end to see what happened um, with recall. So when these individuals are getting that stimulation during slow wave sleep, they're actually getting enhancement of their ability to recall words. And you can see it's quite a bit of, a, of an increase, uh, greater than doubling of their ability to do this task. Um, so the stimulation by enhancing the slow wave sleep that occurred during that deep sleep phase, they were able to improve overall memory retrieval. So again, this, this deep sleep, it's really critical for memory consolidation. And um, you know, uh, I, with these two different tests, and we've learned more and more beyond this, these are just two examples that, um, that sleep helps for memory consolidation. So it's really important to get good sleep. So we're gonna talk a little bit about one condition that's um, a sleep disorder. Uh, in fact, this is a DSM-related disorder to follow up on the previous two lectures. So I want to talk a little bit about narcolepsy. This is a sleep disorder that causes spontaneous sleep. So it's incurable, it seems, 
it's quite debilitating. Uh, in fact, it can be really dangerous for people who have narcolepsy and drive. They could spontaneously fall asleep when they drive and kill themselves or others. And that actually has happened. Um, it's a neurological disease that's characterized by sleep attacks. Uh, episodic loss of muscle tone, that's called cataplexy. Um, hypnagogic hallucinations. Um, so so they, they spontaneously feel like they're seeing something, almost like being in a dreamlike state, despite the fact that they should be awake. And then they, of course, have abnorm abnormal sleep-wake cycles. It is not a common disease. It affects less than one in 200,000 people per year. Uh, but it's very debilitating for those people who have it. You know, falling asleep in the middle of an important meeting. So, you know, all right, this this happens a lot, right? So this this guy just might be falling asleep, but uh, you know, maybe he's got narcolepsy and they're concerned for him, right? Anyway, so narcolepsy does not happen. Uh, it's not just restricted to humans. In fact, we know that there are breeds of dogs that have narcolepsy. So here's a dachshund running around. Um, they can be prone to getting narcolepsy. Uh, uh, Basset hounds are another breed that can get, uh, that are prone to getting narcolepsy. Um, uh, yeah, there, there are more than just those two, in fact. So there are several breeds that suffer from narcolepsy. This is something that we see often in dogs, that they will have certain maladies and weird conditions that show up, and it tends to be breed specific. So it, it, it's actually one great way for us to look at then what is the underlying genetics of those of those species and, and identify genes that may be part of that would explain why certain individuals have this narcolepsy and that it would be restricted to a particular brain it would have to be genetics with that right um and so genetic analysis has shown that many of these breeds they carry mutation for the orexin receptor which is really interesting orexin as you remember we've talked about that with um eating and that it's a, an erectogenic factor, an important regular, regulator of hunger in humans. Well, it turns out that it also plays an important role in sleep and that when it's dysregulated, it leads to narcolepsy. So narcolepsy in humans, that appears to be the, the case as well. So here's data showing humans with narcolepsy that they have fewer orexin positive neurons in the hypothalamus. Orexin is also known as hypocretin. Um, Erection was not really all that well characterized even just 20 years ago, and it was just known as hypocretin back then. We've learned more about it since then, but it was this is one major important study that showed um, in, in the journal Neuron that uh, narcolepsy uh, narcolepsy patients post-mortem, uh, this is human, human tissue, they did staining for hypocretin, so this is just an immunostain, and you can see that we've got plenty of hypocretin cells here. In this part of the hypothalamus, the lateral hypothalamus, where you're going to see orexin positive cells, and that narcoleptic patients, they have fewer. There's some, but there are very few of them. And when you count them up, it's a huge difference. I mean, it, yeah, that's that's pretty substantial. So it appears that even in narcoleptic humans, that there's a deficiency for orexin, but for them, for whatever reason, they have fewer orexin positive neurons. All right, so you must be saying to yourself, wait a minute, Dr. Thompson, we talked about orexin and that it has this relationship with eating. How can it be related to sleep as well? Um, it's not uncommon for a lot of these things to have multiple factors. As we learned today, we talked about cortisol being an important regulator of the overall stress response, but cortisol plays just as an important role in, in initiating the awake pattern in humans that you know people who have dysregulated cortisol function they actually have trouble with sleep because of that so it's not uncommon that you're going to find these cross modalities so given that humans with narcolepsy have a deficient orexin a number of orexin neurons within the hypothalamus it's um uh, there's a, a bunch of studies that show that they also have problems with eating disorders so this is data from one study showing um, that individuals with narcolepsy, so they had 92 in their study total, um, they had a much greater incidence of eating disorders than those um, from a control group. So in their control group, I, I, it's a little weird, they found absolutely no people that had eating disorders. They grabbed 150 random, 152 random individuals. Turns out none of them had any eating disorders. But amongst the narcolepsy patients, they had Two that had anorexia, six that had bulimia, 
So this would be binging and then purging. Um, and this is much higher than what we would see in the general population. And then other eating disorders associated with that as well. Nearly 20% of all narcolepsy patients report having some sort of eating disorder. That's much, much higher than what we would see in the general population, which would be on the order of around 2 to 3% in, in, a, in a big enough sample. Um, right. So there's another study um, that followed up on this. Uh, looking at individuals with narcolepsy, and then they tested their propensity for snacking and their relationship with snack foods. Um, so in this task, they, they had some kind of task they had to do where they had to pick between two different buttons, and then they would get a, a, a reward, a snack reward with that. So it would be either a sweet snack or a salty snack. Um, and individuals with, within this task, they would um, get a reward as they're doing this. And so they're eating as they're doing this task. So that would be, that was during the first phase and they're observing like how, how they're doing and, and the kind of rewards they're getting. And then they had a second phase where they, so after doing the task, they were given as much food as they wanted as snack foods. And they were, they were told to eat till they feel satisfied, like eat as much as you want. Um, uh, but then stop when you feel like you don't really want it anymore. And then they did a third phase, which was the devaluation test. So they basically did the same thing, but during this phase, um, you know, they're now saturated with with snack foods. And then they monitored like how much, how many buttons they were pressing in order to get a reward. And you know, if you're fully satiated, you're going to be you're going to be less likely to want to eat these things, right? Um, uh, but you might want some, right? Like, okay, like, am I going to turn on M&Ms? Well, maybe I don't want them that much, but I do want some. Um, and so what the data showed is that during the devaluation phase, so that's called the devaluation test, because at that point, they're no longer valuing the, um, the snack foods as they did during the first phase. And so then they're looking for the change in how many button presses they do. And for the controls, um, they, 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 they were hitting the button less, um, uh, quite a bit less. For the, for the narcoleptic patients, there was some devaluation occurring, but it was very little. It was only about 4% change in their overall button pushing. So they were getting fewer and fewer rewards. Sorry, they, they were still getting more rewards. They, they valued the snack foods more. Um, and, then, and then after all of this, they did all of this, right? They're snacking here they snack here in second phase they snack in the third phase and then they were just given more snacks so after the whole test was done so the narcolepsy patients they snacked um four times as much after finishing the test so they were just they were like they were told ah eh, take as much as you want um and narcolepsy patients took in four times as much as the controls after eating all of this food and so the idea behind this is that um some of the studies seem to indicate that uh animals and humans that have narcolepsy, they have a disordered relationship with food. They're less likely to seek food. So that would be the erectogenic signal saying like, hey, you're hungry, you might wanna get some food. But as soon as food is available to them, they tend to overeat. And so when it's easy to, for them to get food, um, they don't know when to stop and then they overeat. And so you could imagine then that this will create a disordered relationship for those individuals with food. And that for some of them, um, because they have this desire and drive or, or a lack of a signal to say, hey, okay, maybe I should stop. Um, I should stop eating. The, um, um, especially because like they're not actually seeking food, which is what orexin would normally do. It, it would drive food seeking behavior. But as soon as it's available, they, they have a hard time stopping. And um, uh, that this could lead to uh, bulimia. So that like they're going to be eating too much and then regretting having eaten so much. And so then they'll just purge themselves. So um, yeah, super interesting phenomenon with this connection with sleep and eating and orexin being the nexus for that. So that's it for this lecture. Uh, here are some of the key questions about sleep and memory. How are brain rhythms measured in humans? What is being detected in an EEG? What is epilepsy? How do we define epilepsy? What kinds of brain activities characterize the different categories of st and, and the stages of sleep? What is a hypnogram? And couldn't you read a hypnogram and explain what it means? What is a circadian rhythm 
what are the mechanisms that control circadian rhythms, what stimuli are used, what does it mean when an ethogram is free running, what do and and how would you be able to read that? Like if someone has uh, if an animal has a, a longer or shorter um, internal clock. Uh, what do the four groups from the odor memory test represent in that experiment? And what did they tell us? You know, that one where they had the, the four different odor tests. And what are the results of that experiment and what do they mean? What is narcolepsy and what do we know about what has changed in the brains of patients with narcolepsy? And so that's it. Um, we'll see you next time.